This is our fourth and final introductory session for our course on Al Aqidah at Tahawiya. After completing our study of the biographies of the Imams Abu Ja'far al Tahawi and Ibn Abu Al-Iz al Hanafi, Rahimahum Allah, may Allah have mercy on them, this fourth session covers the importance of Aqidah and some important concerns about the Hanafi Madhab. As you follow this lecture, take notes in your workbook, Tahawiya, the classic text on basic Islamic beliefs, page 15. May Allah Ta'ala give you success and forgive us and you and all of the believing men and women. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the ever merciful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord, creator and sustainer of all things. And the good end result is in favor of the people of piety. And there is no justice just and do animosity except upon the transgressors. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْعَظِيمِ And may Allah, where there is no power, and there is no power nor any ability except through Allah, the Most High, the Great One. وَالصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى سَيِّدِ الْمُرْسَلِينَ May Allah raise the rank of and grant peace to the Chief of all Messengers, نَبِيِّنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ our Prophet Muhammad, and likewise all of his family, followers, companions, and all of those with true religious loyalty to him. Amma ba'd. As for what follows, then on this evening preceding the sixth of the month of Dhul Hijjah, the twelfth month of this year, 1444, in these precious and blessed ten days, the very best ten days of the year, Mukabirina, Muhallilina, Hamidina, Qa'irina, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Wallahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi alhamd. This is our fourth sitting in our sittings introducing the early classic primer on Islamic creed, Al Aqidah al Tahawiya, the creed of Al Imam Abu Ja'far al Tahawi al Hanafi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, the one who died in the year 321. In our first two sessions, we looked at a biography of the Imam Abu Ja'far al Tahawi, and then in our third session, we studied a biography of the explainer of the text, or the most famous and well known explainer of the Tahawi, a primer, that is, Ibn Abul Iz al Hanafi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Having completed those three sittings, we have a few more introductory matters to cover before we begin our study of the text, which will commence, insha'Allah ta'ala, after Eid al-Adha, insha'Allah ta'ala, and we'll be taking that weekend off next weekend. And we'll return to our regular weekly classes the week after that, insha'Allah ta'ala. Sa'ilina Allah al-Mawla al-Tawfiq wal-Najah wal-Sadaad fi al-Qawli wal-Amal. Asking Allah, our protector, for success in that, and that He give us stability and correctness upon that which is good and beloved to Him. So dear brothers and sisters at this time, along with our community online, we have a few issues to look at. Firstly, the importance of the topic, the overall topic of creed, of Al-Aqidah. There are many things to say on this, and in fact a series of lectures could be given on the importance of creed, and why Muslims must busy themselves studying it, becoming aware of it with its evidences, and so on. However, we'll suffice by reminding ourselves with a few basic points. We stand in the Salah, and each and every standing, we say, إِهْدِينَ الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim. Guide us, give us stability upon, teach us, give us our final words and statements and actions upon a sirat al-mustaqim. What is a sirat al-mustaqim? What is the straight path? Some scholars have described it as al-ilmu wal-amal, knowledge and action, authentic knowledge and sincere action that's in conformity with the guidance of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And if you look at all the other religions, that brief summary gives Islam its distinction from all false religion. What religion is there that is authentic knowledge with sincere practice? Except Al-Islam. I'm sorry. Christianity, they might intend that. But do they have authentic knowledge? No. 
They might have many great levels of sincere practice, but without authentic knowledge, they are lawlin, as Allah Ta'ala has described them, astray. And what about the Jews? They have preserved scrolls of knowledge and museums and artifacts and ancient manuscripts. They have knowledge which perhaps can be traced very far back and has some level of authenticity with it. But what's the problem there? They don't share it. They don't practice it. They don't call to it. No action in accordance to it. They hide it. They seek to hoard it. And so they are maghdubi alayhim. They are those who have earned the wrath of Allah Ta'ala for that. In the middle of these two nations and all other forms of negligence or fanaticism is the balanced straight path of Al-Islam which combines those two matters, those two necessary matters, authentic knowledge and sincere practice. Sincere and correct practice. Allah Ta'ala has made us that balanced middle nation. As he has said, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا And thus we have made you a balanced middle-coursed nation. لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ For you to be witnesses over mankind, over all of the people. وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا And in order for the messenger to be a witness over you from Surah Al-Baqarah. So Allah Ta'ala has made us this balanced nation with knowledge and practice. And Allah Ta'ala has shown us that knowledge must come before action. When He directed His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَعْلَمْ Have knowledge, O Muhammad, أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ That no one deserves any worship other than Allah. وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ And seek forgiveness for your sin. وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ And for the believing men and women. اللَّهُمَّ اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ We ask Allah to forgive us and all of the believing men and women. And it is due to ignorance, widespread differing, and confusion that there occurs those who claim Islam as their religion and that they follow its last prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet they are in violation of those ancient teachings. To remain safe, we must adhere to, we must return to and adhere to the pure, pristine way of the early generations of the Muhajireen, those who emigrated with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the noble Ansar, the aiders and supporters in al Medina, the earliest of the companions, and all of them, their knowledgeable scholars, and those who followed them in righteousness, as Allah Ta'ala has praised them, Saying, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانٍ The first predecessors of the Muhajirun and the Ansar and those who followed them in righteousness, رضي الله عنهم Allah is pleased with them. وَرَضُوا عَنْهُ And they are all pleased with him from Surah At-Tawbah. They are the Jama'ah, the companions, the Tabi'un, the early Salaf, the Imams of the religion. They are the Jama'ah. They are the core of the Ummah. They are the very basis and the foundation for understanding the religion as it was revealed to be practiced, as it was intended to be practiced. Their understanding when the people differ is the answer key. It is what all Muslims are required to return to in each and every matter that they differ about. And we've been informed by our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we will split into religious factions and sects as the people before us split into religious factions and sects. He said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ala inna man qablakum min ahl al-kitabi iftaraqu ala thintaini wa sab'ina millah Verily those who came before you from the people of the book have split into 72 groups. وَإِنَّ هَذِهِ الْمِلَّةِ سَتَفْتَرِقُوا عَلَىٰ ثَلَاثٍ وَسَبْعِينَ This religion, meaning Islam, and the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, shall split into 73. ثِنْتَانِ وَسَبْعُونَ فِي النَّارِ 72 are in the fire. وَوَاحِدَةٌ فِي الْجَنَّةِ And one is saved in paradise. وَهِيَ الْجَمَاعَةِ And they are, that one group is, الْجَمَاعَةِ They are those who are upon the same religion as the Prophet and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his noble companions. That must be the case because Allah Ta'ala has said, 
فَإِنْ آمَنُوا بِمِثْرِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَادِ اِحْتَدَوْا If they believe as you have believed, the believers, when this verse was revealed, who are being addressed, who are they? The group of believers, they are the Prophet ﷺ along with his companions. And for this timeless guidance, in this verse recited all the way until the last day, until Allah Ta'ala removes the Qur'an, from the earth, the people will be guided by this verse. If you have the same faith, the same beliefs as those people, then you will be rightly guided. It was recited then, it is recited today. This verse means to us today. If you differ with the companions in your beliefs, you are wrong and they are right. They are rightly guided and you are misguided. If you believe as the companions believed, then they were rightly guided and you are rightly guided. It's not guesswork. It's facts that have come from Allah Jalla wa'ala. That verse is in Surah Al-Baqarah as well. Out of all of the matters in the religion that we need to, as a priority, believe in, practice, hold to, and be correct on the way the companions were, is the issue of the core elements of our belief. The fundamentals of aqidah, what we believe in. The very basis of our religion. That which if we don't have it, then everything changes. When you remove the root of the tree, it doesn't matter what kind of fruits the tree had. Because the root is now gone. The tree dies. So the creed is the core. And everything branches out from it. So then... If Allah Ta'ala wants good for us, He grants us firmness in our understanding of His religion, most specifically how to believe in Him, Jalla wa'ala. As He said, as His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith of Mu'awiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, collected by the two Imams, Bukhari and Muslim, Man yuridillahu bihi khayran yufaqihu fiddin. Whoever Allah wants good for, he grants him fiqh. He grants him understanding in the religion. And someone might say, that hadith is about fiqh. That hadith is about wulu and salat and zakat and fasting. No, dear brothers, that hadith is about fiqh in the religion, which begins firstly and foremostly with how you understand your Lord and Creator, how you worship Him alone and shun all partners that are set up unto Him in worship, how you identify actions and statements of tawheed and embrace them and take them as your religion, and how you identify actions and statements that oppose that, of polytheism, or deviation, or innovation, and reject that, and shun that. Those are the most important affairs. So then if we are granted success by Allah Ta'ala, and favored by Allah Ta'ala, with understanding in His religion, then the first thing that we'll understand is, how our Lord is to be worshipped alone, how we describe Him, how we speak about Him, how we exalt Him, as the companions exalted Him. How do we understand His attributes? How do we understand His qadr? These are issues that the companions all knew, believed in, understood, and took as deen, and had no brotherhood with those who opposed these fundamentals. For when the first wave of deviants came from the Qadariyah and others, they came to Abdullah ibn Umar and said, there have appeared some people who say there's no qadr, and that affairs just happen. Things happen randomly, and Allah Ta'ala has not decreed them. They just happen. Abdullah bin Umar, what did he say? Yeah, if you see those people, akhbirhum, tell them, anybody un minhum, wa annuhum bura'a minni. If you see those people, tell them that I'm free of them, and they are free of me. To emphasize that he did not view their Islam as being valid. At all, he said, if they were to spend a mountain of gold in charity, Allah Ta'ala would not accept it from them until they believe in Qadr. And Qadr means then that you believe that Allah has knowledge of all affairs and He decreed all affairs. He wrote them and He willed them into existence. Without believing this, you are upon other than the religion of the companions. You are upon other than the book of Allah Ta'ala and the sunnah of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And thus fiqh in the religion, understanding the religion starts here. Understanding your core creed. And thus one of the early Imams has a book called Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar, the greater fiqh. Who knows who wrote the book and what the topic of that book is. Abu Hanifa al numan Ibn Thabit, Al-Kufi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, the one who died in the year 150. Whenever you hear until today someone's a Hanafi, that's an inscription to this early Imam. 
His book is Al-Fiqh, Al-Akbar, the greater fiqh. What's the topic? Al-Aqidah. So when we say fiqh in the religion, as understood by the early imams, then it includes firstly and foremostly the greater fiqh, not the lesser fiqh, how to make wudu, what are the conditions for the wudu? That's the lesser fiqh. The greater fiqh is the creed and how you believe in Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. And so we've now introduced this man, this great figure, Abu Hanifa al numan And it's important for us here at this masjid to study a text in creed that is written by the scholars of this madhab in order for us to complete our study of classical texts of creed by the four imams. When we say the four imams, we mean the four most famous of the imams of the early generations of the Muslims, the first 300 years. These are the four most famous, but not the only imams. Today we say the four imams, and some ignorant people might say you have to ascribe to one of these four. These are the only four madhabs, the only four ways that you can learn Islam and so on. And that's not correct, as there were imams on their status, and some of them having great virtues that outdid some of those four imams. But these four imams are the ones whose teachings were serviced, explained, and spread more than anyone else. And they were, as you know, Abu Hanifa, the first of them, al numan ibn Thabit al-Kufi. He died in the year 150. And so he was from the first century and he lived into the middle of the second century. And then after him came Malik ibn Anas al-Asbahi, Abu Abdullah al-Madani. Malik ibn Anas. When you hear someone's a Maliki, this is an ascription to Malik ibn Anas, the Imam of al Medina. He died in the year 179. His student, was Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, who as a young boy, he read the Muwatta to al-Imam Malik. And when you hear that someone is a shafii his ascription is to Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, who lived a relatively short life, born in 150 and died in 204, meaning 54 years. That's all. And he's one of the four greatest imams in the history of al-Islam, subhanAllah. And then his student was Abu Abdullah Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal al-Shaybani al-Baghdadi. He died in the year 241. Rahimahum Allahu jami'an. May Allah have mercy on all of them. So we've studied a Hanbali text, or many Hanbali texts actually. You can call the most recent book on creed that we completed a Hanbali text. What was that? al wal authored by Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim ibn Abdul Salam ibn Taymiyyah, al-Hanbali. And you can also call Kitab al-Tawheed a Hanbali book because of the madhab of its author, Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. And other books like Al-Usul al-Thalatha and others are classified as being written by Hanbali authors. We've studied with our brothers in Masjid al-Furqan in Canada, Wafaqahum Allah, Sharh al-Sunnah by Al-Imam al-Muzani, Rahimahullah, from the greatest of the Shafi'i, scholars. We've studied here in this masjid about eight years ago what's called Al-Muqaddima Al-Qayrawaniya. From among the Maliki scholars was Ibn Abi Zayd Al-Qayrawani Rahimahullahu Ta'ala. And so all of these were early texts and we have not actually studied yet a text from the Hanafi Madhab. And so that's our goal at this time to study this book which has been met with a lot of scholarly approval over the past 1,100 years. As many as 15 explanations have been written for Al-Tahawiyya, excluding the modern explanations. And among the scholars of today who have explained Al-Tahawiyya in brevity or at length, we have Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, we have Sheikh Saleh al-Fawzan, and other great scholars have explained At-Tahawiyya. The book has been mentioned by Ibn Al-Qayyim, rahimahullahu ta'ala, in his Nuniyya, when he said, وَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ قَوْلِ الطَّحَاوِيَّ الرِّضَىٰ وَأَجِرْهُ مِنْ تَحْرِيفِ ذِي بُهْتَانِ Look at the statement of At-Tahawi, which is good and pleasing. That means his creed that he wrote. And give him protection from the distortions that have been made by people of falsehood. Meaning, some of those 15 explanations throughout history have been written by, actually many of them have been written by followers of different cults. From Asha'ira to Maturidiyya and others. And they have tried to use some of the wordings and the expressions of Al-Imam al-Tahawi 
rahimahullah ta'ala, which were ambiguous to support some philosophical explanations which stand in opposition to the way of the Salaf regarding the attributes of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. And examples, of course, will be given and studied throughout our study. Being that this is a Hanafi text, there's an important tenbi, an important clarification of a matter that needs to be understood as we go into the study of a Hanafi text. And that is that the scholars of Al-Kufa, meaning the Hanafi scholars, inherited a flaw in their creed that goes back to Al-Imam Abu Hanifa and through his teachers. What's that flaw? The very definition of faith, whether it is a statement and an action or just a statement and a belief in the heart, they opposed Ahlul Hadith and Ahlul Sunnah in this issue. And they held that Iman is only in the heart and on the tongue. And Iman is not essentially inclusive of the actions of the limbs. Now, we look at this error in creed with a very important and balanced look. We look at it, firstly, with the scale of truth. Is it right or wrong? If it's right, we endorse it. If it's wrong, we refuse it. When it's wrong and we refuse it, we look at how the scholars of Al-Islam have refused it. Did they refuse it and consider those who carried it from amongst the Hanafis, Abu Hanifa himself and others, to be outside of the fold of Islam or outside of the fold of Ahl sunnah or did they make excuses for them? And this is very important. How many of you have heard that Abu Hanifa was criticized for his aqidah? You've heard this, right? This is correct. How many of you have heard that he was considered to be da'if in hadith, unreliable as a hadith transmitter? You've heard this, and this is factually correct. We can't rewrite history because we love a certain imam who reached a status that was appreciated and loved throughout history. A carrier of hadith was judged by stringent standards and if he didn't meet those standards, he was called da'if. It's not a personal attack on his person that he was a weak person. It means he didn't meet the standards of Ahlul Hadith in conveying narrations. Because number one, Abu Hanifa only had a few hundred hadith in total. And me saying a few hundred hadith is being generous. Earlier imams, those who lived in his era, some of them said he had 150 hadith. Most of them were confused. Some of them said 250 hadith. Most of them being flawed. These were the imams of his time. In an era when a man would memorize a hundred thousand hadith, and he would travel from land to land. The culture of the people of Kufa was not to travel to collect hadith. That was not their methodology in studying their religion. They didn't have those rihalat, those journeys to gather and compile hadith. They had a different approach. They were called Ahlul Ra'i for a reason, the people of opinions. They would look at the small collection of hadith narrations they had, and they would postulate. And they would present their opinions and they would discuss how rulings could be extracted from those narrations without having a complete body of the narrations of the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, how many of you have heard that Imam Abu Hanifa opposed hadith narrations with some of his opinions? That's technically correct, but it's going somewhere that could be false. Now when I say he opposed hadith narrations... We have to stop and look at that carefully as the imams did. As for example, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah did when he looked closely at this issue in his writings like Raf'ul Malam and in other places where he talked about this issue. How many of you have heard that he would reject a hadith from the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that was authentic to follow opinions? You may have heard that. And that is tajawuz. That's going beyond an accurate description of what happened. As Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah clarified, and I'd like to read to you now from Majmu al-Fatawa, the 20th volume, roughly about page 304, where he said, Rahimahullah ta'ala, after giving examples of how Abu Yusuf, the companion of Abu Hanifa, was presented by Imam Malik with a number of cases of narrations which opposed the positions, the opinionated positions that they held, one of them famously being 
the actual size of the mud and the saw, the measurements of the people of Medina. They were small bowls and large bowls. So Al-Imam Malik asked the people of Medina to all go and gather their bowls, their utensils, their measuring tools. The small ones called the mud and the larger ones called the saw that they would use to buy and sell grain and things in the marketplace. And he found them all to be in contradiction to that which was in place in El Kufa. And Abu Yusuf, upon seeing this, retracted his position on the size of the mud and the saw and went with the mud and the saw in place in Al Medina, knowing that these tools and utensils were left over from the companions and their children. So giving examples like this of Abu Yusuf, retracting opinions and following narrations, following evidence when it came to him. He would say, I retract this, and if my companion was here, Abu Hanifa, he would also retract this. He spoke on behalf of Abu Hanifa, saying he would also have retracted this. You've heard beautiful narrations from Abu Hanifa in the introduction of Sifatu Salat al Nabi, the Prophet's prayer described by Shaykh Muhammad Nasruddin al Albani. Those narrations should be reviewed. The statements of Abu Hanifa about following the Sunnah and opposing his opinions when you find a clash. That presents an asl, that presents a foundation that represents Abu Hanifa in his absence. That he was not a man who would ever say, my opinion is more precious to me than this hadith that you're bringing to me. But hadith narrations would come to him and he would refuse them and he would continue to hold his position. And for this he was criticized. But what was his reason and his excuse for not accepting the hadith narration that would come to him? Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentions as many as 20 of them. And I'm going to read to you so you understand exactly how to view this issue. He mentioned examples of even in the life of Abu Hanifa, how he contradicted his opinions or analogy to follow narrations that came to him that he held to be authentic. And then he said, إن هذه الأحاديث أيضا حجة إن صحت لكن لم تبلغه. These narrations that were in opposition to his opinions, when they're authentic, they didn't actually reach him. Remember we said he only had a few hundred hadith? And that's being generous. So then, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, وَمَنْ ظَنَّ بِأَبِي حَنِيفَةَ أَوْ غَيْرِهِ مِنْ أَئِمَّةِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ أَنَّهُمْ يَتَعَمَّدُونَ مُخَالَفَةَ الْحَدِيثِ الصَّحِيهِ لِقِيَاسٍ أَوْ غَيْرِهِ Anyone who assumes that Abu Hanifa or others from the imams of the Muslims, that they would intentionally violate an authentic hadith to follow analogy or some other opinion. فَقَدْ أَخْطَأَ عَلَيْهِمْ Then he has erred in how he has viewed them and assessed them. وَتَكَلَّمَ إِمَّا بِظَنِّنْ وَإِمَّا بِهَوَىٰ And he has spoken either with assumptions and presumptions or hawa desires. فَهَذَا أَبُوْ حَنِيفَ يَعْمَلُ بِحَدِيثَ التَّوَضُّ بِالنَّبِيذ فِي السَّفَرِ مُخَالَفَةً لِلْقِيَاسِ وَبِحَدِيثِ الْقَهْقَهَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ مَعَ مُخَالَفَتِهِ لِلْقِيَاسِ لِاعْتِقَادِهِ صِحَتَهُمَا وَإِنْ كَانَ أَئِمَّةُ الْحَدِيثِ لَمْ يُصَحِّهُهُمَا Here's Abu Hanifa. He mentions a couple of issues where he took the narration that he considered to be authentic and rejected what would be in line with analogies and opinions based on his stances and other issues because he viewed those narrations to be authentic. Even if those narrations weren't authentic, the bottom line is his goal was to follow what came from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that's what Shaykh al-Islam is trying to prove here. He said, وَقَدْ بَيَّنَّا هَذَا فِي رِسَارَةِ رَفْعِ الْمَلَامِ عَنِ الْأَئِمَّةِ الْأَعْلَامِ And we have clarified this issue in the treatise called Raf al Malam, removing the blame from the great scholars. That none of the Imams of Al Islam ever opposed an authentic hadith without excuse. There was always some excuse that is to be offered. They have as many as 20 different excuses which can be found for them. Mithla, and here's a brief summary of Raf'ul Malam. We're unable 
to study the entire Raf'ul Malam at this time, the book which is offering excuses for the Imams who opposed hadith narrations. He says, مثل أن يكون أحدهم لم يبلغه الحديث Like one of them just having the hadith that didn't reach him. Quite simply, how could he have judged properly in the case if the hadith on the topic did not reach him? And remember we talked about hadiths in Bukhari and Muslim not being accepted by Abu Hanifa. And Abu Hanifa died in 150, Bukhari died in 256, and Muslim died in 261, and their books didn't become staple books in hadith until after they passed. So then Abu Hanifa didn't have Bukhari and Muslim and just choose not to follow them. Understand historical context. So the hadith didn't reach them. And what's beautiful about the book Raf'ul Malam by Ibn Taymiyyah is that he provides examples starting with the Khulafa al-Rashidin. Starting with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq who didn't have a hadith in an issue. And he judged incorrectly until the hadith came to him. And then Umar, and then Uthman, and then Ali, and then the fuqaha of the Sahaba, and then the greatest of the Tabi'een. So... Here, logically, if Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, the best of this ummah, could judge incorrectly in a matter because he missed the hadith, and then the hadith is brought to him and he recognizes the error, then what about scholars a hundred years later, two hundred years later, and so on, when they err? Is it not possible and completely understandable that a hadith would not reach them and therefore they would be left to an opinion which might not coincide with that hadith which didn't reach them? أَوْ min wajhin lam yathiq bihi. Or the hadith reached them, but they thought there's something wrong with the chain. Maybe the chain that was brought to them was indeed flawed. And that hadith is known to be authentic by a number of other chains. And they didn't have those. That's an excuse that you offer. Or they received the hadith and they considered it to be authentic, but they didn't see how that hadith would apply to that issue. Or they believed that hadith was authentic and it reached them and it applies to the issue, but it's abrogated and they considered another hadith to be something that abrogated it. Subhanallah. Or things that indicate abrogation and other examples like that. And so the excuses like these for a scholar, sometimes the scholar who didn't have the hadith, He gave an opinion that would actually be correct anyway. And he just didn't have the hadith. His opinion turned out to be correct once the hadith showed up. And some of them gave an opinion that was wrong, proven to be wrong when the hadith came to them or when the hadith was known to their students and so on. And so they're rewarded for their efforts and their mistakes are things that we seek forgiveness for them for. We say, oh Allah, forgive Abba Hanifa. Oh Allah, forgive the imams of the Muslims. لِقَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى Due to the statement of Allah, رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَاخِذْنَا إِنْ نَسِينَا أَوْ أَخْطَأَنَا Our Lord, do not take us to account if we forget or if we genuinely err. And it's also important to mention, remember Ibn Taymiyyah said, whoever thinks that Abu Hanifa or anyone else from the Imams intentionally violated the speech of the Messenger of Allah or the guidance of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has erred. And this error is either due to assumptions or hawa or desires. And I say there could be a mix of both. There could be a mix of both. Let's introduce the culture of that second century. Imams of Hadith going after Hadith. And the people of Ra'i, the people of opinion sitting in their gatherings, postulating, presenting their opinions, discussing and debating what could be extracted from the small body of literature that they had. There was serious criticism from Ahlul Hadith against Ahlul Ra'i. And so often that criticism was based on correct information, like their position on Iman and other issues that had been corrected, like the statement about the Qur'an being created, held by some of them, and other deviations in creed that caused Ahlul Hadith to warn against them, to be on guard against them, and to even refuse them when they would come. Now imagine the solution for the people who are sitting in gatherings of opinions 
in an era where people are spending their lives gathering hadith narrations to get the full picture before they form their opinions. What's the solution for the people of opinions to become more accurate in their speech? Get more hadith, right? But animosity had been built. And so a man from Ahlul Ra'i would come and say, I want to learn more hadith. And they would say, shun him, he's from Al-Kufa, don't let him sit in your gatherings. So there was adawa. There was animosity. And as mentioned by the scholars of Al-Islam, this animosity that exists sometimes because of madhabs, because of lands, because of differing of teachers and, and teachings and all of that, it causes people to accept things without the proper levels of investigation when it comes to criticism of those people. Like we already take them as opponents to the sunnah, so it's easier for us to accept some things which may not actually check out. Let me give you a real quick set of examples of some criticism that are obviously beyond what is believable to be from the narrations of Abu Hanifa or accurate criticisms of him. Let's start with the book Al-Majruhin by Ibn Hibban, a book of criticized narrators, where he has a biography for Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. And Al-Imam Ibn Hibban rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on him, was mutashaddid. When he spoke against someone with criticism, he would go beyond where the balanced critics would go. That's the meaning of being mutashaddid as he was categorized. So he brings this report with his chain back to Yahya ibn Hamza and Sa'id ibn Abdul Aziz, who are not known to have met Abu Hanifa, yet they narrate that they heard Abu Hanifa saying, لو أن رجلا عبد هذا البغل, or maybe النعلة, there might be a word in the Arabic language which was misread by some of the scribes of the early manuscripts. If a man were to worship this mule, or perhaps he said, this sandal, تَقَرُّبًا بِذَلِكَ إِلَى اللَّهِ جَلَّ وَعَلَى Seeking nearness to Allah the Majestic and Most High by way of that, لَمْ أَرَى بِذَلِكَ بَأْسَى I see no problem in doing so. And Ibn Hibban does not comment at all about this narration. Unbelievable to be from the speech of any Muslim, let alone the speech of one of the greatest imams of knowledge. Go to Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi's famous monumental work, Tarikh Baghdad. In the biography of Abu Hanifa, he mentions what's for and against Abu Hanifa from the narrations attributed to him and from the criticism and praises of his contemporaries and those who came after him. He mentions a report with his chain back to Al-Qasim ibn Habib, who himself was considered worthless as a narrator. He said, وَضَعْتُ نَعْلِي فِي الْحَصَى ثُمَّ قُلْتُ لِأَبِي حَنِيفَ I propped up my sandal in some pebbles, and then I said to Abu Hanifa, أَرَأَيْتَ رَجُولًا صَلَّى لِهَذِهِ النَّعْلِ حَتَّى مَاتَ إِلَّا أَنَّهُ يَعْرِفُ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبِهِ What do you say about the case of a man who prays to this sandal until he dies, yet he knows Allah within his heart. فَقَالَ مُؤْمِنٌ He allegedly said, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, allegedly said, that's a believer. So I said, the narrator, Al-Qasim ibn Habib says, لَا أُكَلِّمُكَ أَبَدًا I will never speak to you again. Again, unbelievable as a report. Unauthentic and unbelievable. Yet in a time and in an atmosphere of animosity, narrations like this could be accepted or tolerated because it's against someone that we have something against. Another ridiculous narration. It's attributed that Abad ibn Kathir, who himself was not a reliable narrator, said to Abu Hanifa, رَجُلٌ قَالَ أَنَا أَعْلَمُ أَنَّ الْكَعْبَ تحق. A man says, I know that the Kaaba is real. وَأَنَّهَا بَيْتُ اللَّهِ And that it is the house of Allah. وَلَكَنْ لَا أَدْرِي هِيَ الَّتِي بِمَكَّةِ أَوْ هِيَ بِخُرَاسَانِ But I don't know if it's that one in Mecca or is it in Khurasan. A mu'minun huwa? Could that be a believer? قَالَ نَعْمْ mu'minun. Allegedly, he said, yes, that's a believer. This is baltiniya, to believe in the phrases that have come in the texts, but to claim the meanings could be anything 
subject to any interpretation. قُلْتُ لَهُ فَمَا تَقُولُ فِي رَجُلٍ قَالَ أَنَا أَعْلَمُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ A man that says, I know that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. وَلَكِنْ لَا أَدْرِي هُوَ الَّذِي كَانَ بِالْمَدِينَةِ مِنْ قُرَيْشٍ أَوْ مُحَمَّدٌ آخر. A مؤمن هو? But I don't know if it's that one that was from the Quraysh tribe in Medina, or is he some other Muhammad? Is that a believer? قَالَ نَعَمْ He allegedly said, yes. Subhanallah, exalted be Allah. Do you see how narrations like this can be thrown in with actual, accurate criticism? And then what we come out of it with is a stance against the person heavier and more severe than what is actually appropriate for the situation. Al-insaf, al-insaf. Be fair and be just in criticism. The great Maliki Imam Ibn Abd al-Barr al-Nimari Rahimahullah Ta'ala, the great explainer of the Muwatta of Al-Imam Malik, his hadith book. He has an excellent book about manners of knowledge called Jami'u Bayan Al-Ilm Wa Fadlihi. He said in that book about this mix of criticism and praise for Abu Hanifa and how we can understand some of those narrations. He said, Rahimahullah, الَّذِينَ رَوَوْا عَنْ أَبِي حَنِيفَةَ وَوَثَّقُوهُ وَأَثْنَوْ عَلَيْهِ أَكْثَرُ those who narrated from Abu Hanifa and considered him to be reliable and praised him are greater in number than those who spoke against him. And those from Ahlul Hadith who did speak against him أَكْثَرُ مَا عَابُوا عَلَيْهِ الْإِغْرَاقُ فِي الرَّأِي وَالْقِيَاسِ وَالْإِرْجَاءِ Most of what they blamed him for was going overboard in opinions and analogies as well as الإرجاء That's excluding actions from إيمان وَكَانَ يُقَالُ يُسْتَدَلُّ عَلَى نَبَاهَةِ الرَّجُلِ مِنَ الْمَاضِينَ بِتَبَايُنِ النَّاسِ فِيهِ It said that you can know about the intelligence of a man, the great status of a person from those who have passed by the differing of the people about his status. قَالُوا أَلَا تَرَى إِلَى عَلِي بْنِ أَبِي طَالِبٍ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ Don't you see the case of Ali ibn Abi Talib? Peace be upon him. أَنَّهُ قَدْ هَلَكَ فِيهِ فَتَيَانِ مُحِبٌ مُفْرِطٌ وَمُبْغِضٌ مُفَرِّطٌ That two different kinds of people destroyed themselves by way of him. One loving him excessively and the other hating him excessively. That's the end of the quote from Ibn Abd al-Barr. One final point about those who said that Abu Hanifa used to say that the Qur'an is created until he was debated about that and then he retracted that. And if that's the case, then we cannot blame him today for that because he retracted it, he denounced it. If that is accurately, historically transmitted, however, you should know, some of the early imams did not even believe that that took place. Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, he mentions in his Tariq Baghdad, in the biography of Abu Hanifa, after narrations from the imam himself where he denounces the position of the Mu'tazila, that the Qur'an is created. And he says clearly that the Qur'an is not created as the imams of the Salaf said. He said, وَقَالَ النَّخَعِي النَّخَعِي said, that's Ibrahim, النَّخَعِي حدثنا أبو بكر المروذي قال سمعت أبا عبد الله أحمد بن حنبل يقول He says, I narrate from Abu Bakr al-Marruzi who heard Abu Abdullah Ahmed bin Hanbal saying, لم يصح عندنا أن أبا حنيفة كان يقول القرآن مخلوق. It is not authentically established with us that Abu Hanifa ever said that the Quran is created. And Allah Ta'ala knows. There is a line of poetry attributed to Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i that he said, Rahimahullah, وَعَيْنُ الرِّضَى عَنْ كُلِّ عَيْبٍ kalila." The eye of pleasure, meaning the critical eye that looks at someone he's pleased with. This is someone I agree with, some of my allies. It is blind to every defect. Meaning he's with us. So he made a mistake, don't worry about it. But it is the eye of contempt that brings out all of the blemishes. It brings out all of the mistakes. Meaning when you're looking at someone critically because you dislike him, it's very easy to see all the mistakes. Versus the one that you look at, 
that you're pleased with. And you've seen this. It's a human thing. It's not a thing associated only with the people of desires. Notice Ibn Taymiyyah said, Imma bi wa imma bi hawa. Maybe by assumptions and maybe by desires. Criticism based on assumptions and desires is unacceptable criticism. And when you do look at the compilations of criticism against Abu Hanifa and Ahlul Kufa, you'll find things in there which represent a readiness to accept everything that's been said without so much investigation. You'll find that. You'll say, how could that be something narrated from Abu Hanifa? So, passing on criticism or accepting invalid criticism of one's opponent whether that was because of conjecture or because of desires. As an error regarding the right of an individual who's being criticized, it does not represent a person's methodology. You get it? Not every point of criticism against a man from Ahl Sunnah, which is unjust, means that the critic must be exposed and refuted and warned against and dropped. Al-Imam, Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli, from the Imams of Ahlul Hadith, there were some personal issues of jealousy that Al-Imams, like al dhahabi mentioned, personal jealousy, that Al-Imam al-Bukhari came to his land and the people left his study circles. And they all went to al-Bukhari till there was almost no one left learning from him. He began to look at what Al-Imam al-Bukhari was saying until he began to pass on that al-Bukhari had said, Lovely bil Qur'ani makhluqun. My recitation of the Qur'an is created. And that was a time when there was war on the Jahmiyyah and the Mu'tazila for their statement that the Qur'an was created. So this statement was passed around. And for those who already had some animosity against Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, it was easily accepted, unjustly accepted. As Al-Imam Al-Bukhari never said that statement. And he denounced it openly. And he swore by Allah that he never uttered such a statement. Yet with that, it was pinned on him. And according to some circles of people, that is the aqidah of Imam al-Bukhari, no matter what he says. And based on it, he was ousted. And he was exiled from lands. And he lived in exile for the latter part of his life. My point is here, Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli, who made this accusation erroneously and unjustly, remains an imam in hadith. He remains in chains of hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari today, subhanAllah, and in the books of hadith today, while what he said about al-imam al-Bukhari was not correct. It represents an individual error, an incorrect assumption, perhaps a moment of following desires, It's mistaken, and it's not acceptable. It's refuted, it's not endorsed. And the person who said it is sought forgiveness for. May Allah Ta'ala forgive Al-Imam Al-Dhuhli. But he's an imam in hadith. He's not to be dropped because he erred in his position on one individual, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari. So likewise, the imams who spoke erroneously about Abu Hanifa, then they're excused. The imams who spoke accurately about the mistakes of Abu Hanifa in creed, they are appreciated and supported without going overboard, without fanaticism, without neglect of the right of the imam to have forgiveness sought for him and without fanaticism in his favor, rejecting all criticism against him. Yajibul insaf, we have to be balanced and we have to be fair. So having said that, mistakes are looked at, mistakes in creed or anything else. They're looked at with the scale of justice, truth and falsehood, erroneous or accurate. If it's erroneous, it's not accepted. If it's accurate, it's accepted and it's endorsed. With that, when it's incorrect, it is refuted even when the erroneous person will have his image and his reputation protected and words will be used in a very kind way about his error, the mistake will surely be corrected and no one reaches a status of being an imam that you can't mention his mistake and you can't refute a mistake he made because who are you compared to that imam? If that's about the imams of the religion, then what about the YouTube stars and those who spread falsehood and errors all over the world day and night? And then when you say something about one of their errors, every child with a YouTube account writes about you that who are you compared to Mufti Fulan or something like that. Wallahu al-musta'an. Errors are corrected depending on the status of the erroneous person 
his reputation may be preserved if he's from the people of bid'ah, of innovation and desires, then it's one more proof against him and he's warned against with sternness and harshness at times depending on the strategy of Ahlul Ilm, that is their base behavior in dealing with the people of innovation, that is to warn against their errors and their individuals. And as it relates to Ahl Sunnah, to warn against their errors, but to uphold their reputations. And that's how we look at the errors of the Hanafi Madhab in creed, that issue of al irja or understanding Iman to be limited to only statements and beliefs and actions are not from them. That issue will be discussed in detail, just so we don't walk away not understanding what's the evidence against that mistaken position. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Iman bid'un wa sittuna shu'ba or sab'una shu'ba. Iman is 60 or 70 some branches. The hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. A'laha qawlu la ilaha illallah. The highest of those branches of Iman is the statement la ilaha illallah. Wa adnaha imatatul adha anit tariq. And the lowest branch of Iman is the removal of a harmful thing from the roadway. Wal haya'u shu'batun min al Iman. And shyness is a branch of Iman. So the Prophet ﷺ told us in this authentic hadith, there are 60 or 70 some branches of Iman. That's called Iman, faith. This is what Iman is. That's the topic of this hadith. He gave only three examples of those branches, the highest, the lowest, and a branch somewhere in the middle. The highest branch is a statement. La ilaha illallah. The lowest branch of Iman is an action, picking up a harmful thing from the way of the people. And shyness, which is something in the heart, the action of the heart, is from Iman. Three branches are given as examples, but they represent categories. Iman is on the tongue, Iman is in the heart, and Iman is on the limbs. That's from the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So then Iman surely does include actions. And there's a long discussion for that topic in its time, but just so we have at least one evidence that's agreed upon by the two Imams, Bukhari and Muslim, to oppose the erroneous statement that actions are not an essential and integral part of Iman. That should be clear from that one hadith. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. There's another problem that we'll encounter with this Tahawi creed, and that is the organization of the ideas. But compared to the first issue, a disorganized, cluttered writing from the 4th century is excusable. From the early years, they didn't have a lot of rewriting and second stage of editing and all of that. So quite often, the writings would be, based on today's standards, disorganized. And so we will struggle a little bit with that. We'll see the issue of Qadr introduced and then left, and then we'll come back to the issue of Qadr later in the book, and then a third time, and then a fourth time. We'll see various issues coming and going, but we'll be patient with that, as that is not an essential flaw in the book. That's just something we'll have to struggle with and be patient with as we go through our book. And other things could be said in this introductory lesson. However, our time has come to an end. We ask Allah Ta'ala to bless our gatherings to grant us success in these blessed days of Dhul Hijjah, to give us success in coming together in these Friday night sessions in study of Al-Aqidah Al-Tahawiyah. May Allah Ta'ala forgive and have mercy on Al-Imam Abu Hanifa and Al-Imam Abu Ja'far Al-Tahawi and the Imams and scholars of Islam throughout history. Wallahu a'lam wa salli allahumma wa sallim wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.